Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the pod. We are still discussing the brand new, massive, and most importantly, free state of travel report by our friends at Skift Research. Last week, we had our feet firmly planted on the ground as we talked about hotels and online travel, but today we are going to take off and dig into the state of airlines. Here to help, we're joined by research analyst Asha Brisby and Skift Airlines reporter Meghna Maharishi. Hello, guys. Welcome. Hey, Seth. Hey, Sarah. How are you guys? Excited to be on the podcast. Yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. So quick reminder before we get started to send any questions or comments that you might have to podcasts at skiff.com. And please don't forget to follow or subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening or watching. And if you like it, if you're enjoying it, please rate us five stars and leave us a positive review so we can spread the word about the Skift Travel Podcast. All right. So we're going to dig in. Oh, you know what? I forgot to say hi to Seth. Hi, Seth. Hey, Sarah. Good to see you. How are you? I'm good. good I'm you. good. Yeah. Yeah. You hanging in there? It's been a busy you know, week. The stretch of the summer. <laughs> this, this is it. Peak summer. Global Forum is coming up. I mean, that's a little, little yep. bit of an ad, but also a very real amount of prep that we need to start working on. So the, it's that and the final last licks of summer. Last licks of summer. All right. So this is your report, Seth. This yes. this massive, wonderful free report that Skift Research did. We're going to talk all about airlines. Why don't you start us off? Give us a little, give us a little bit of level setting, the 35,000 foot view of the state of the airline industry, according to Skift Research. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the view from the uh, from the cruise and altitude of the cabin for sure is that things are are pretty good in the industry. Um, you know, airlines were one of the hardest hit sectors. I mean, it, it, it was actually many it's because it feels so long ago. It's hard to remember, but it was actually many years ago. People were petrified of airplane. I know. And so even yeah. as travel started to reopen, airlines really lagged. We saw short term rentals lead. We saw hotels lead and we saw the platforms that sell hotels and short term rentals recover much faster than we saw airlines recover. One of the big themes we've been talking about in the state of travel 2024 is that this year and especially going into next year is one of the first years where there's, again, <laughs> pardon the aviation puns, uh, headwinds or tailwinds, right? Like we had a really big COVID headwind. Then we had a really big revenge travel tailwind. This is one of the first years where like things are kind of, I mean, they're not necessarily back to normal, but they're certainly not really defined by the pre or post pandemic era anymore. And airlines have been recovering fairly well. There's a lot of nuances though, uh, to that statement, you know, there's a big asterisk in that statement. Um, what I wanted to do to maybe kick off this conversation is just start again at that high level. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to start with this question for both Ashab and Magna, both of you. I mean, Ashab, you have, you did our, your airline analyst. You did this section of the state of travel about airlines. Magna, you cover airlines for us great, excellently on Skiff News. Um, I mean, Ashab, what is the broad state of the airline industry today, in, in your opinion? Sure, Seth. So let me quickly jump into just the global recovery as it has happened in 2024. So airline, the airline sector has recovered as of December 2023 fully and compared to other travel sectors, which ended up recovering on an average slightly earlier than the airline sector. But I think airlines have shown remarkable recovery, resilience, and uh, just ability to innovate in this new way of doing things. So let's talk about recovery in terms of revenues. So in 2023, the airline industry is expected, is forecasted to go about 750 US dollars, which is 22% higher than where it used to be. The industry revenues used to be. And again, these are forecasted numbers coming directly from IATA, which is our industry, the airline industry body, which is the International Air Transport Association, which represents over 300 plus airlines. And in 2023, Revenues from 2022 grew by roughly 15%, and it's about 22% higher than where it used to be. In terms of revenues, clearly, uh, the industry has grown. In terms of profitability as well, which was an area, again, the airlines was in fact struggling a lot. At an industry level, operating profits 
are going to be around $60 billion, which again is an industry record. It's going to be an industry record in 2024. And that is essentially going to account for the 6% of the total revenues, which is uh, basically where industry used to normalize in pandemic. 5 to 6% was what the industry made at a global level. So both in terms of revenues, yeah, yeah. So both in terms of revenues as well as profitability, the industry looks like it's doing very well. And Magno, what are you seeing when you go out there and talk to talk to people, like both all the executives, actual humans that travel, customers? Like, what what's the feeling you get out there in the wild? I think it depends on which airline executive you ask um something like a delta or united it's so optimistic they're doing so well they're pretty bullish on the fact that first class and international travel is going to continue to to boom but then if you talk to maybe like a southwest or even a spirit it's not as rosy yeah um it's kind of interesting to see how coming out of the pandemic it it's basically like there are two carriers that have just done remarkably well and have kind of been at the top of their game and then everyone else is kind of struggling at least in the u.s market just for a host of different issues so i'd say it really depends on who you're talking to the two that you mean are delta and united yes well that's actually what i wanted to dig into that was going to be my next question and then for both of you maybe magna you you, you start and then i'll throw it to a shot but like yeah i mean Ashab just gave us the numbers, 6% margins, you know, revenue recovery. It seems like things are going well. And in the aggregate, it seems like things are going well. But I think to your exact point, there's when you you lift up the hood, um, quite a lot of dispersion and disparity between these different airline players. I mean, what's what's causing? Why is Delta doing so well? Why? Yeah. Why is Delta doing so well? Why is this happening? Um, I mean, minus like the crowd strike outage that it dealt with and everything following it. Um, I think it's just the fact that people have been wanting to travel premium and then and international like that's been carrying it for the most part. I think the same goes for United. They both have a really strong like first class product. They're both also um, getting to enjoy the resurgence in business travel. And they both also have a pretty strong international network as well. And those trends have just managed to like sustain themselves for the past um, two or two, three years. And um, so that's mostly why they've been doing well. I think the other thing that's worth noting is that they've also been trying to court more budget travelers with expanding basic economy and also expanding capacity in destinations that are popular um, for budget travelers like Florida and the Caribbean. And they've been able to compete really well against like the spirits and the frontiers. And they're kind of causing them to sort of now revise their schedules. Yeah, I was going to say, is it that there just are that many people that really want to pay, you know, $4,000 for a plane ticket and fly business class, you know, to some to to somewhere that would might cost 700 bucks in economy? Or is it that they are actually taking away the budget traveler from the spirits and the frontiers and the Southwest and maybe even throw American Airlines into there uh, occasionally? Well, what do you think, Ashab? I mean, you've done a lot of thought on this. Is what do you? What is your take on that? Much well, hundred percent agree with what Megna just said about these, both about Delta and United. And just to add a bit more context here, we say Delta, United, and these are traditional mainline carriers. And these legacy carriers, they have massive networks. They have different hubs in the country, and based on their massive networks worldwide, and they also have multiple different cabin classes. So even before the pandemic, they used to have a first class, business class, freedom economy class, and then the basic main economy, discount economy class. But what has happened in, in, in the industry right now, and again, I'll come back to you as well, Sarah, you, you talked about, you touched a very important point as well. I'll come back to you. But what has happened is the growth of premium cabin revenues has basically swept all the airlines, has an impact everybody across the aisle. So I'll give you some numbers here. Delta's premium cabin revenues have touched, in 2023, have touched about $19 billion. And compared to 2019, which was just about $14.9 billion, for so a growth of 30% between 2019 to 2023. The premium cabin revenues have grown by just 11%. So 
there has been growth in economy products as well and in overall economy revenues but their premium product premium products and their premium revenues have grown by more than double so a 30% growth in premium and about 11% and a very very important phenomenon that's happening in the us is it's not just the corporate business traveler that is getting the premium payments right now what's happening and very recently oag did a survey in the us about and they interviewed about 2000 Uh, travelers and they found out that Gen Z and millennials, who are traditionally known as you know, uh, conventional wisdom, says that they would opt for the cheapest product available because of their lower income averages. They they said that about 29 percent, 29 to 30 percent on average, said that they are willing to pay a hundred dollar more for the right airline product, and that's massive. So it isn't just yeah. the corporate, the traditional corporate and business class people who are now making more business class flights uh, because we know corporate travel hasn't recovered 100% it's actually people who used to travel in economy who are now upgrading to premium economy or now upgrading to business class so and that's been a phenomena that has helped carriers like delta air right it because they had already had exposure to premium cabins and on the other side of the aisle because ultra low cost carriers never really had any even guys like you cannot go on a first class ticket on spirit right so they they have been struggling Sarah. it's interesting it's such a it's such a product that like flying business class it's such, i've i've talked at length about my love of business class flying i mean what's not to love but i love it more than most people do i think but it's really hard to go back like for anyone who's like done it Exactly. once or twice like after the pandemic or like during those times when everything was super cheap and people weren't flying to your point Seth you know it took a while before that actually happened if you ha- if you got a taste of that it's it's, it's hard it's difficult well, to go back yeah. let me ask you this Sarah yeah. I want to ask you this Sarah what is your thoughts as a as a business class lover and a connoisseur of yes. business class yes. what are your thoughts on premium economy is it just not close enough or is it is yeah. it good enough for you See, I'm I'm also a short person though. Like mm. I'm only 5 foot 2. And so I I don't know, biz, like premium economy economy, it doesn't it doesn't do anything for me. Like I I don't care. But I can see if you were like my husband is like 6-3. Like that's a big deal for him. Like you know, whether you're going to get that like extra legroom. I don't really care. I I really want the accessory bag. Like I'm a sucker for that. Like I just I and I know it. Like I feel it. Like I know that like it's not even as good as like what I could go out and buy for like 20 bucks, but I still I love it so much. Yeah. I don't know. I'm 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 like a walking like I, marketing dream, you know. <laughs> yeah. They got you. They got you with the little slippers and the socks. Uh yeah, I did. Mean, I I would say, you know, I'm just going to ask you Magna if you hear this. You know, Shop's give us some Delta. Delta doesn't break out premium economy from business class. And I'm very curious. I have a suspicion that a lot of the premium premium cabin growth is the premium economy of people getting that taste of business class. But then, I mean, I'm fine. I'm taking a big trip. I'm going to go international. I'm going to fly premium economy. I just can't afford business class. But the thought of doing a trip to Asia in economy just fills yeah. me with dread. So I, you know, I, I don't know. What I mean, are you have thoughts on that, Magna? Yeah. So I mean, they haven't really. They never really separate the two, and they haven't really said like, oh, like premium economy has been growing like crazy, and like business hasn't. I will say though, they all have said that even like first class has grown a ton in the past two, three years, and they have also. I think all the big three airlines have talked about expanding capacity in first class, even. um which was once something that they were going to kind of like phase out in favor of more business class seats. Yeah. So there is clearly some sort of demand for people who just maybe want to splurge on an expensive seat and have a comfortable flight and that sort of thing. I will say just even anecdotally like you can walk into an airline lounge and it will most likely be pretty crowded like despite whatever airlines have been doing to curb the overcrowding. Like they're all pretty much like filled. So like people are clearly flying like business and first and there is still that desire too which has been interesting to see. Can I can I point out one more thing because I think Sarah you you asked that question really well. You said is it just that there's more competition from the network carriers or is it that people want more premium and the answer seems to be both. There's this third aspect and I and I should maybe talk a little about this and Magna too. Um the low cost carriers 
are have lost their expense advantage over the network carriers. Isn't that also what's happening? The low cost, the low the low cost carriers are often called that not because they sell low cost tickets, but because they run low cost operations. And I think part of the, I mean, yeah, I mean, jump in here, Ashab, jump in here, Magna, you know, help me out here. But my understanding is that they're they are their operations are much more expensive to run these days as well. Sure, I, I could go first. So very recently, I actually wrote a report on the state of U- ultra low cost carriers in the US. And one of the key things that I try to highlight in my report is, which is why they were actually struggling right now for profitability was they just don't have the same level of op- operational efficiency that they used to have. So, it, so it's about okay, aircraft utilization, the number of hours, average number of hours that you they used to they were used to flying pre-pandemic, it's much lower right now. Secondly, the cost advantage that they used to have, that we just pointed out, the cost that they used to have was basically the same throughout the last decade, but right after the pandemic, it, it just blew up. So I guess uh, if I can recall this uh, these numbers, uh, Spirits Chasm X Fuel, and this is an industry metrics that we use, which is all the expenses per aircraft miles flown, except for fuel. So because fuel is something that airlines definitely cannot control the prices, but everything else stocks, everything else is included. And that is maintenance, that is rent, that is labor, that is everything else. That value went from five cents to about 7.5 cents between 2019 to 2022. And if, from 2014 to about 2019, that was somewhere between 5 to 5.5 cents throughout the last, almost all of last decade. And it went from 5 to 7.5 to between 2019 to 2022. So the cost advantage that they used to have that allowed them to offer competitive seats at competitive prices, that was no longer there. And additionally, they were just no longer as operationally efficient that they used to be. And then... There was one more thing said, if you remember, United, American, and Delta, they all introduced a comparable basic economy class that was very much comparable to their discount economy class. So they had a comparable even class as well that was competing directly with them. So they no longer had that business boat that they used to have. So all of those factors combined, now it's becoming extremely difficult for the ultra low cost carriers to sustain operations. Sad times um, to be a spirit or a frontier. Yeah, Magna, please. Oh uh, yeah, I also just want to add. I think it's worth noting as far as the cost goes, since it's they've been going up for everyone. Um, a big part of it has also been driven by labor costs, essentially skyrocketing since the pandemic. Um, all the airlines have been signing these record contracts with pilots, and then when American, Delta, or United does it, then the others have to follow suit to keep their pilots on board too, and then that kind of also causes cost to increase significantly. And now there's also the issue of flight attendants and a lot of them are in the middle of negotiations too. And that's also just been like further hampering a lot of these low cost carriers as well, just having to even offer competitive contracts to their pilots and flight attendants. Yeah. Are they, are, what do you think, Magda? Are the, are, are the big, are the big groups going to go on strike? Like bring out the crystal ball. What do you think? Do you think it'll happen? Probably not. It's, almost like yeah. impossible for um, flight attendants or pilots to strike just given the labor yeah. laws um, in the US. And um, I think also Biden administration would want some sort of deal reached. Um, I mean, American flight attendants just reached um, a contract after really like testy exchanges between management and the flight attendants. It did get to a point where mm-hmm. it seemed like it was possible they were gonna strike. United flight attendants are still in the middle of negotiations too right now and delta flight attendants are also trying to unionize they're the one um major airline that doesn't have unionized flight attendants at the moment Hmm. so speaking of american airlines magna you did a really cool interview with fasting raja and talked about american airlines distribution battle why don't you tell us a little bit about that yeah um that's been interesting um vasi raja was one of the people who really championed um having American have its own tech platform for um, bookings. And they kind of expected um, 
online travel agencies and corporate booking platforms to adopt that tech and do those direct bookings. That way, when customers would book with them, then they would be able to earn more miles um, and get more competitive fares. And that strategy fully backfired on American. They've been losing quite a bit in revenue because of it. They also have essentially missed out on the business travel boom because of this strategy. So it's been interesting to see the fallout of that because now they're really walking it back and they're kind of trying to go back to status quo because it got so much blowback. Um, But it was interesting in interviewing Basu because he was still pretty bullish on that strategy for booking Mm. and kind of saying that it was more efficient and it was something that airlines needed to do to modernize, but it doesn't seem like the industry would is anywhere near like that point right now. I think it's fascinating. I was so excited when you got that interview, Megna. I really enjoyed it because I love these kind of distribution things. And it ties in, by the way, just to connect those dots. It matters for these conversations because Delta's uh, business class or first class product is called Delta One, right? The business class. And, um, you know, JetBlue has that Mint or Spirit Airlines has that big front seat. They want to have those brandings for their products that they're trying to sell to position themselves as more premium or to position themselves in this market. And that that technology platform that you're talking about was very much designed to help travel agents articulate that better and um, just debate over whether it was effective or not. But I think it's a fascinating time. Um Look, I mean, let's, let's pause there. There's a lot going on in the U.S. market. The market is healthy. There's changes in distribution, changes in low cost, premium demand, more competition, lots of exciting stuff happening. But the airline industry is a truly a global one. So we've covered the U.S. We're going to hear a quick message from our sponsor. And when we get back, we're going to go global and look at airlines around the world right after this break. Welcome back, everybody. First. We're going to go to Asia Pacific. Seth promised a discussion of everywhere outside of the United States. We're going to jump right in with China. So China has really struggled with international growth. We have a rise in all things India airline related. You know, let's talk about those two places specifically, because they're the ones that have really got the industry's attention for different reasons. Right. So what about Air India and Indigo? Like they've made a lot of news recently. Um, what do you take on their strategies and what's going on there? All right. So India is a fascinating story. And by the way, just so you know, I'm from India, based out of India, and use both Air India as well as Indigo's network. <laughs> we got so, some first party. We can get some real feedback here. This is uh, exactly. your. So, so, so the market has. So let's let me quickly, I guess. Before I jump into specifics about Air India, let's just 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 a couple of thoughts about the, the Indian domestic market. So between 2013 to 2023, the domestic Indian market has doubled, right? So in just a span of 10 years, the domestic market has basically doubled. And Air India, which used to be government-run airline, moved was being sold to the Tata Group in about 2019. And they recently started this process of this this massive transformation process where they have four different airlines. There is Air India, which is the flag carrier. Of India. There is Air Asia X, Air Asia India. There is Vistara. And the fourth one is Air India Express. So these all of these four carriers are being brought under a single brand, which is now being led by the company one of the biggest conglomerates in India. And they are now going to make sure that Air India is these, as good as some of these biggest network carriers globally, right? So the transformation is underway right now. And there are news about everything that's happening in Air India. There are, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to bring four different airlines operated in four different ways in, in, into one single umbrella under one single leadership. So it's a bit of a challenge right now, but they have a massive aircraft order in place. Some of their newest aircrafts have already entered their fleet. And what people who have started uh, getting on board these aircrafts are talking about is, first and foremost, they, and now, they now have a renewed and an exceptional onboard service, which was something that, was, that Air India was never known for, if you have ever traveled Air India. 
or have heard about in India. So the new aircrafts are giving uh, network uh, possibilities into some of the biggest locations in Europe and North America. They're now adding direct flights into Newark as well as JFK with their newest a There are a lot of developments that are happening both in terms of hard products. And when I say hard products, these are aircrafts. And when I say soft products, this is everything to do, to do with your onboard IFE services, which is in-flight entertainment, Wi-Fi, meals, everything else, right? So there are developments that are happening there. So Air India wants to make sure that they now are the biggest carrier or will be the biggest carrier, at least internationally, for Indians who are traveling abroad to UK, Europe, the US. And we've already seen what's happening with Indigo, which is one of the biggest low-cost carriers globally, has one of the biggest and the most exclusive networks in all of India, holds about 45% of all its routes exclusive to itself. So there are many things happening, but those are just uh, a few points. What surprised me about the India market is that Indigo is in many ways larger than Air India. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. I mean, so that says something about Air India. I mean, maybe not the modern version of Air India, but it says something about how Air India got to where it is today that a low-cost carrier has is, has surpassed them in many ways, right? Absolutely. Air India is the national flag carrier of the country, but it's Indigo, which is the biggest airline in the country, and not just domestically said. If we look at international uh, networks, and if we say... In international short haul and medium haul, Indigo again is the leader. So despite Air India having some of the best slots at some of the best airports internationally, it's Indigo that's nominating short and medium haul. But it's the long and ultra long haul where Air India essentially is still bigger than Indigo. And that's largely because of its years and years of operations. And if going by, I mean, Campbell Wilson, who is the CEO of Air India, that is exactly where they are, they are going to continue to focus on, which is the long haul international and the ultra long haul international space, which is where they're going to continue to focus. They don't want to compete with Indigo on the short and medium haul. They want one of their subsidiaries, which is Air India Express, to compete on the short and India and the medium haul. It's the long haul, which is going to be the focus of you. Maybe, I mean, Magna, maybe this is for you. Tell us a little about, about China aviation. Is that, um, is that what it once was, or are we still seeing, I mean, what's, what's the state there? Um, it's interesting with China. So basically on international routes, they have become so competitive and they are doing pretty well on the international front because they're able to outcompete their American and European rivals with lower fares and slightly shorter flight times. Um, so on that front, they've been doing well, even though in other respects, um, Chinese economy has been slow to rebound since the pandemic and um, spending has generally like slowed down there. But when it comes to routes to New York, California, or anywhere in Europe, they have really managed to um, outshine the European and American carriers that are now beginning to pull back on their capacity to China. And a lot of European and Australian carriers are even dropping their like routes to China just because they have not been able to compete. And I think it's interesting. You said they have shorter routes. I mean, tell us about how they have shorter routes. I think that's cool. Yes. So they're shorter by around like a couple hours. And that's mostly due to the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, American airlines and European airlines are essentially banned from flying over Russian airspace, but Chinese carriers are not. So they've been able to take advantage of that, basically. And that's mostly why they are able to have those shorter flight times, just because the routes to Europe and America require them to fly up north first, which requires them to fly over Russia. Is that something that is publicized or that is well, like, do they... uh kind of advertise or market that as a competitive advantage anywhere? Um, I don't, they don't really need to advertise it is the thing, because if you were yeah. to look up a flight from New York to Beijing, for example, the cheapest options are mm-hmm. most likely going to be the Chinese carriers. And you can just see on Google flights, like the flight time is also shorter compared to what you get with like a yeah. United or a British Airways. 
there's yeah. a certain extent to which advertising that might backfire maybe yeah i mean it's a it's a really uh dicey situation to bring into you know some sort of like a marketing conversation right <laughs> but I, I i can i can imagine it happening here anyway <laughs> you know we're kind of shameless about that stuff yeah sometimes. for sure i mean writ large yeah yeah depend on how you well never mind i'm not gonna say politics um magna i want to just keep, i mean keep keep us going let's let's keep moving mm -hmm. i think we've got so i think it's fascinating that china the chinese airlines are seeing a strong recovery they're competing on price competing on time which is such a rare thing to see india continues to grow market has doubled let's move on to to europe and you, I, I know you've, you've reported quite a bit on european aviation what would you say magna is like the state of play of of european aviation today I'd say like with in Europe, um, most of like the big airlines there are not doing as well. Like I wouldn't say they're experiencing the same sort of success that the big network carriers in the U.S. are. A lot of them have been dealing with really high fuel costs, and that's been really hampering their bottom lines. Um, another big thing that's been an issue has also been strike actions. Um, I know Lufthansa recently lowered its outlook and is now just trying to break even for the year just because its flagship carrier is just struggling to be profitable. So they've been really plagued by um, higher costs for the most part. Um, even with Air France, it, for them, they had a pretty disappointing second quarter um, on top of the fact that they also took a pretty big hit from the Olympics um, being in Paris. And if you want to hear about that hit and the Olympics being in Paris, we did interview uh, Ben Smith about this exact topic. Yep. So that's in the, in the, in the podcast archive. I wanted to ask on this European topic about um, what's the answer then to this lack of profitability? Can can will these airlines be able to like merge and acquire their way out of this? Or is it something that needs to be done differently in terms of strategy or routes or network? Like, do you have any thoughts about about that? Yeah, so I know Lufthansa has said that it's trying to implement some sort of turnaround strategy to um, fix its fortunes. They haven't given too many details on what that looks like. They, for example, have struggled with a ton of issues. I think there's also just not been as much demand for travel to Germany. They've also have been having to compete on their Asia routes and the, also the issue with China is there too. So they, for example, have been dealing with just like a host of issues. Um, but I think also as far as like mergers and acquisitions go, that also seems pretty difficult for them to do. I would say the European Commission seems to be pretty hawkish on consolidation within the airline industry. They don't really tend to approve most mergers in that in industry, um, citing competition reasons. And it's created a bit of this conflict between these big airline executives that want more consolidation and the government, which does not, um, because airline executives have been saying that time and time again, they feel like they need to then bail out the smaller um, airlines that aren't able to do as well in the region. And they would rather just have the ability to um, merge with them instead. Um, so it doesn't really seem like though, just given um, how the European Commission is that consolidation is the most viable strategy for that part of the industry right now. And shop not, not to pick on Lufthansa, although they did cancel my flight back from India. So maybe I will pick on them just a little bit because of a strike action. Um, Ashab, I mean, you, you actually just wrote something about the, the German market. Is that right? Like, what did you find when you were looking at the German aviation market? So Seth, would you believe uh, that the German market in 2023 is a lot less, is a lot smaller than what it used to be a decade ago in 2013? Do you, do you find that fact believable? Not really. It's like the biggest economy in, in Europe. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing but it is based on the setup you're giving me here, but <laughs> that's actually true. So one of the one of the biggest things that's happening in one of the biggest economies in Europe, which is Germany, is that because of high airport fees, low cost carriers like Ryanair, EasyJet, and Wizz Air, they are all pulling out of German market. And to give you some numbers, Ryanair reduces capacity by about sixty seven percent, and around that same number is EasyJet, Vizair reducing its uh, capacity to Germany by about roughly 30%. Even Lufthansa talking about high airport fees at Frankfurt Airport, which is their main hub, has impacted their profitability as well. But 
that's a much much bigger issue for low cost carriers because they want to streamline their operations they don't want to pay high airport fees they generally choose regional and secondary airports and uh, higher airport fees is just not something that they want to do and because of these lcc is pulling out of the market that airline market has actually shrunk it's much smaller than it used to be 10 years ago and that's okay that's again a problem that, uh, with uh, with france as well the airline market has not recovered and that's because they're seeing a lot of domestic these markets domestic is switching to trains there right i mean we talked about we also talked about that with with yes. smith right I was just making that one spoil point that they're both Spain and the Spanish government and, and the French government, they want people to take planes instead of the short haul flights. So they have this new rule in place that if you are, I guess, uh, so if your flight is under 2.5 hours, you, you should probably go ahead and take a train instead of taking a flight. So they have all these rules where they want to discourage as many short haul flights as much as possible. So that's also impacting uh, airlines and the markets. So let's move now to a place that is decidedly not getting smaller. Uh, that would be Saudi Arabia and its aviation market. I mean, we've got Riyadh Air, we've got Fly Ideal, Saudia. Uh, when I when when we went to Dubai uh, last year, I flew Saudia um, on my trip there. So. You know, what does the future look like for the big three, you know, Emirates, Etihad, Qatar, with these Saudi Arabian airlines kind of making a bit of a splash um, in that region? Magna, what do you think? Well, um, Riyadh Air still hasn't launched yet. And um, it's interesting because I think with the Saudi airlines, I'm not truly sure how competitive they can be when it comes to Emirates and Etihad, for example, mostly because of um, the restrictions on alcohol. That's been a really yeah. big thing. And um, I recently spoke to Riyadh Air CEO Tony Douglas a couple months ago at a luncheon in New York, and he was trying to act like it was not going to be a big issue. But um, yeah, it's just like people people like to have drinks on their flights. Um, so I'm I'm honestly like truly just like not sure like how competitive they can really be when Emirates is offering alcohol, Etihad is offering alcohol, like all the other um, Gulf carriers are offering a similar service to that of the Western ones. Um, so that'll be like interesting to see, especially with something like a Riyadh Air, for example, they want to be really big in the West. Um, they want to have a big presence in Europe and America. I do not drink on flights. Yeah, neither do I. I don't. I, I love I like just, ginger ale. Yeah, I don't either. It's just, I, you know, I, yeah, I, it's too disruptive to the jet lag and everything. Like, there's no, there's no need to make it worse for me. I wrote a whole story on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I, so I just don't. So like when I flew Saudi, it didn't. They had delicious juices. I will say. Yeah, it's such an interesting point. So good. I love the little yeah. nuances of the airline industry. To be honest with you, though, it would not have occurred to me that alcohol would be a major competitive disadvantage. I would think if I get yeah, a good ride at route at a good price, and I would just book it. I don't. I don't know. I, to me, yeah. it's more the question is as much more about will people want to go to Saudi in the volumes that they have ordered aircraft for? Right. I mean, I don't know the number off the time I had it, but isn't it like one of the largest aircraft orders in the world? Riyadh Air. Yeah, or... they, yeah, yeah, they have um, quite a few from Airbus and Boeing. Um, and again, that's also interesting in that um, I feel like when Douglas was at this luncheon a couple months ago, I feel like a big part of him being there was supposed to sell Saudi Arabia to all the um, airline executives in the U.S. and the investment bankers and the lawyers who work in the industry. And it was interesting yeah. because the audience still seemed really skeptical about wanting to travel to Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think also, again, they still just do have a lot more restrictions compared to other countries in that region. One of the, one of the coolest things about my about my trip when, when I flew them is I had a really long layover. Um, so I got I left the airport. They have an e-visa program that you can just get get a visa. And I, you know, it, it is it is interesting. I mean, I know we work in the travel industry, so it's a little bit is kind of a little bit of an occupational uh, bias, I suppose, to yeah, to, to going. But um, it was so great. Like, it was so great to be able to have that experience 
just for a day and get the car and go out and look around. And I, I've never been to Saudi before. I'd love to go back. Um, but, but yeah, that's an, it's another thing for them. Like my mind is open to, to travel, to traveling there. And it, it kind of, you know, it gave me just a little bit of a taste and I'd like to, I'd like to go back personally. Yeah. I mean, I'm be curious. I mean, you know, Qatar does something yeah. as well. I think they also do layovers. You can go see the souks and, yeah. and that sort of stuff. I mean, I, I just want to throw this to you a little bit of shop. I mean, I know you've written reports on this space. Also, a big part of Saudi's airline capacity will probably be deployed into the Indian market as well, right? So it's interesting uh, that uh, say that it's going to be deployed. Yes, for sure, it will be deployed into Indian market. But I think the one differentiation that Tony was talking about uh, was that they want to make sure that they fly to different places and make people come to Saudi instead of being, uh, instead of operating like Etihad or Emirates, where they're transporting passengers from west to east. They want to just do more direct flights from Saudi to the rest of the world. I think that's where they don't want to get into that competitive space transporting passengers. But even saying that, India will continue to be a big source market for them. Although low yield passages, but it's still going to be a very big market for them. So it's going to be interesting. But I'm, I'm going to piggyback on Magna's point that uh, alcohol is important, maybe f- not for economy or premium economy, but definitely important for the total business class and first class experience. I think it's definitely very, very important. And as of, I've never flown business class, so I'm not exactly sure, but <laughs> I do understand. <laughs> uh, I keep watching these videos from all these YouTubers and Influencers who would love to talk about that. It is, it is a very essential component of the overall business class experience. So I am I think that's going to be. I'm so fed up with these uh business class influencers. I don't know if this is a niche that infuriates anyone else, but I think that could be a whole podcast topic, Sarah, of just talking about these influencers. I'm I'm curious where your anger comes from. So I think absolutely. All right. It's, hold it's it. for, for a different podcast. We'll podcast. leave it for the we'll, we'll leave it for the we're, podcast. We're coming yeah. Coming towards the end of this one. I wanted to ask just look, while we're on this topic of Middle East Airlines, and it's gonna come back full circle to our first conversation. We were talking about the demand for premium. I wanna get your thoughts on these premium airlines in the Middle East. They have done such an amazing job building these brands around luxury and high touch. I mean, I, this is just a big question, picture question. Maybe I'll throw it to, to both of you, but maybe we'll start with Magna. Like, um, is this sustainable? Is this kind of premium travel? I mean, we're, this is more of a, let's make this a global question. Is the premium demand we're seeing for the Emirates of the world, for the for the Saudias of the world, for the United of the world, is that sustainable demand? And do you think that that's like, there's a real path forward there in the airline market? All the airline executives at those airlines you listed will say yes. I will say like for me, like I've always been a little bit skeptical of that Um, business travel and first class travel for that to be able to be so high. That's really reflective on how the economy is doing overall. And uh, at least like in the U.S., like the U.S. recovered pretty well from COVID and hasn't been necessarily dealing with inflation in the same way as like other countries have. Like we still have it, but it's not as bad as it maybe has been in like Europe or in Asia, for example. Um, So that whole trend is just fully dependent on how long like the economy is going to stay strong and I'm a little bit skeptical of it like continuing to be that way in the coming years like, I don't think it'll necessarily tank but I could see it softening potentially um, and I've always thought that it was a bit of like a big bet to think that like people are gonna always want to spend a lot on a first class or business class seat in the long term just because of that ad. But I'm not. I'm not sure. Like that. Those are just my two cents. Do you have a cent or two to add, Ashav? I think I'm actually positive and optimistic about it. I think it's going to continue to grow. Number one, because so let's let's get the numbers here, right? Business travelers, first class passengers, they represent about twelve percent of the total passengers for an airline, but they contribute about more than 70, 70 to seventy five percent of all the profits. So these high yield passengers, they contribute a lot to airline profitability. So recently, Emirates announced that they'll be adding 8,000 more premium economy seats on their 777s and their uh, on their A380s. I guess one of the reasoning is, one of the forward-looking reasoning is that the economy is going to continue to be as strong as it is right now. 
is it going to be very sustainable in the short term maybe i, I think it's sustainable but in the medium term it could be something that they'll have to probably so, come back and visit so what i'm and hearing that's... from both of you is um what i'm hearing from both of you is it's the economy stupid uh, and so I think, <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly the right place to end it, but you know, these are sectors that are highly travel tied into the economy. I mean, our state of travel report is, I think to Megna's point, mostly upbeat, but certainly there are some concerns. Lots to see, lots to see how things are going to happen, how things are going to change and how that economy plays out. Um, but we'll, these are great debates to have. I'm really excited, uh, but what's the comment? And it's been a really exciting conversation. So, so Megna and Ashab, um, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about the state of aviation in 2024. Really enjoyed it. Thank you both. And thank you, Vigna. This is awesome. I thought this was a five-star conversation. If you thought this was a five-star conversation, then let us know. Rate us five stars on wherever you get your podcasts or like or subscribe. It really helps the channel out. And if you have any questions for us, you can always write to us, podcasts at skiff.com. All right. Let's leave it there. Bye, Seth. See you next time. See you next Bye. week. Thank you for listening to the Skiff Travel Podcast. Wherever you're listening, please make sure to subscribe. If you like what you're hearing, rate us five stars or leave us a positive review. It really helps get the word out about us, our podcast, and make sure that we can still continue to bring it to you free of charge every week. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. And don't forget to hit that notification bell as well. That way you'll know every time we have a new episode.